All right, let's get started. Thanks everybody um, for, for coming. Uh, it's, it's an honor to be here today. I have a, a great panel of um, experts on um, AI and policy and open source here. Um, who I'll let introduce themselves in, in just a second. I'm, I'm Justin Colonino. I, um, I'm on the board of the Open Source Initiative. I'm also a lawyer uh, at Microsoft where I work on um, open source related issues, um, inbound, outbound licensing, things like that. Um, let, before I, I get to the panel and let them introduce themselves, I just want to make a few remarks to kind of set the stage on uh, for this conversation about policy and open source AI. Um, and, and, you know, it gives me actually a lot of pleasure for, I, I didn't always work at Microsoft, I've been there seven years, but it's really great to say like, you know, open source won, right? It, open source is ubiquitous across software development. Um, everybody's come around to the fact that um, transparency, collaborative improvement, autonomy, and the freedom to use code for any purpose drives innovation and allows all of us uh, to learn from and build upon what's come before. Um, through that process, the 25, 30 year history of, of open source, um, the open source definition has been a guiding light um, to that process. And the reason that open source one um, is that it removes barriers to sharing. And that's what the open source definition does. It says, you know, for, for the developer, uh, I want to share something, the license removes barriers to sharing. It does it in two ways. The first way is it says, hey, you know, take, take a broad license to this uh, software. And the second, it says, please don't uh, sue me uh, for, uh, you know, if you use the software badly. You can, might remember some of the, well, I do because I'm a lawyer and I read open source licenses for fun. But some people try, you know, no, no nuclear, you know, you can't use this in a nuclear plant, like that type of warning. Um, used to come in to, to some of the licenses, and the idea was to get, uh, op you know, to, to say, hey, you know, I'm sharing this with you, but, you know, use it your own, own risk. And what that's done is it's allowed the dissemination of that innovation um, throughout the world. The zero marginal cost economics um, have really, um, you know, driven um, that value and innovation uh, for the world. Um, but... After open source one, uh, with great power, I guess, comes great responsibility. Um, and there are new regulations, particularly in Europe, um, imposing barriers to sharing. You have um, the, the CRA around security. You have the um, product liability directive, um, you know, saying that you know, certain components need to uh, be safe from a product perspective. Um, and the original drafters of open source licenses uh, were, were seeking to avoid that kind of liability so that everybody could share their code everywhere. Um, the, there's been hard work from, um, you know, Linux Foundation, Open Forum Europe, and, and um, OSI to educate policymakers, you know, about the, the risks of that type of regulation by putting barriers to sharing would have on that um, open source ecosystem. And what's fascinating to me in kind of what was probably, you know, a dream uh, uh, 10 years ago is that policymakers are listening. They, they, they come out and they say, you know, hey, how do we, how do we keep the open innovation cycle uh, working in, even with these regulations? And, you know, you think back 10 years and maybe the bad old days of the, you know, proprietary Microsoft and and open source and like the fact that the policymakers are actually going out and asking the question to the open source community is is a huge win and and people are recognizing and the and policymakers are even recognizing those benefits and and they're the benefits are huge so um there's a start study i don't know if everybody's heard this is about six months old out of harvard business school and um, university of toronto that estimates the demand uh, side value of open source at 8.8 .8 trillion dollars um, to put that in perspective, not to um, talk too much about Microsoft, but that's about three times the market cap of, of Microsoft, one of the most valuable companies in the world, depending on the, depending on the day. Um, and what's, what's interesting about that comparison to me is that Microsoft's also built on top of zero marginal cost economics, right? Uh, they build software platforms and they ship them everywhere with the goal of enabling people to build on top of those platforms and, and do what they want with them. 
But, the, but there's a friction in the way that Microsoft does it because they charge money for it. And the fact that you know, open source is valued three times uh, Microsoft in that, in that study, it's not necessarily apples to apples, but what that shows is that the permissionless innovation provided by open source, that you can just pick it up and use it, really drives um, um, that zero marginal cost economic um, win. So with that as prologue, what does that mean for AI, right? Um, there are one million models or close to one million models available on, on a platform called Hugging Face right now that developers can pick up, use under open source license terms or not. Um, and, and they're out there and, and, and we're, we have another wave of frictionless innovation uh, coming. And then with the, the EUAI Act uh, provided an exception um, for, for open source innovation. And so then I, I wanna, in this panel, I wanna talk a little bit, I wanna get the, my panelists because they're the experts, not me, talk a little bit about the history there and then how definitional work done by OSI, some openness frameworks done by Linux Foundation kind of impact um, you know, that policy conversation that we're having um, in Europe and, and more broadly um, in the world. So with that, I'll let the panelists introduce themselves, please. I start because I have the microphone and um, I'll introduce myself before I start uh, disagreeing with you. Hey. Yes. Love it. <laughs> uh, feeling feeling <laughs> nice uh, this morning. Um, so hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Sachi Kamuto. I'm the chair of an organization called Open Forum Europe. Justin kindly mentioned us in his introduction. Um, I'm also a, a senior researcher at RISE, which stands for uh, Research Institutes of Sweden. We're a state-owned uh, research institute. Um, and so I'm not a open source AI uh, expert. Um, I'm surrounded by, uh, by such experts, uh, I would say. Um, but uh, as you mentioned, uh, Justin, Open Forum Europe has been involved in the policy uh, process. Um, not as much as, as we should, given that this is a sort of $8 uh, trillion uh, industry. I think we have 8.8. .8. Um, we should have put more resources into um, engaging in that policy process, but we are also otherwise engaged in other, in other processes as well. So, um, and I should say, incidentally, I was at your panel session yesterday where, Stefano, you said you are not an, uh, an AI expert, but I think, you know, um, we can agree that at least you've done a sort of deep dive into it. Yes, uh, you have some scars to prove it, maybe even. <laughs> okay, so, um, but just on your point that you're making that everyone agrees that open source has won, I would say open source has won, but not everybody knows that open source has won. And I would include policymakers uh, in general that they don't know that uh, open source has won. And I think to some extent, the reason we saw initially uh, this kind of exception language in both the CRA and in the draft AI Act was precisely because policymakers had not understood um, that this was an $8.8 .8 trillion sort of um, activity. And so it was more about sort of making a, uh, an exception for, for open source hobbyists, et cetera. Uh, so we can maybe start there. I, so I am hoping to bring this kind of policy perspective to this discussion. Thanks. All right. Uh, I'm Stefano Maffulli, I'm the executive director of the Open Source Initiative, which is the organization that is recognized as the um, maintainer of the open source definition. And recently we have expanded our research into understanding what the principles of open source can be, how they can be translated into the, the new domain of AI. And yes, we, we have won, but it's not over yet. It was a battle, not the war. <laughs> Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Ken Osborne. I should start by saying that I'm feeling quite frail, suffering from food poisoning, so I may or may not need to run out of that door at any point. Um, Senior, just walk over. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I sat here. Um, 
yeah, so I normally wear two hats. Um, the first is that I'm a researcher at the Linux Foundation, and the other is that I'm a PhD candidate in social data science at the University of Oxford, where I'm now in the finishing months of my, my thesis on the political economy of open source AI. Um, and uh, before that, I worked in AI policy at the, the UK government, uh, where, uh, amongst other things, I helped write the UK's AI strategy. And believe it or not, back then in 2021, open source was not really discussed in policy rooms, at least in the UK government. You look up the UK AI strategy, you won't f find open source mentioned once, which is insane. I need a shout out to the French government for being quite you know, forward looking in their AI strategy, which came out also in 2021. They announced uh, funding for creating a data science commons and uh, biased, but they, they, they're supporting scikit-learn, which I'm a contributor to, which is a Python library for machine learning, in case you're not familiar with it. So, but nowadays, everyone's talking about open source AI and governments are really interested in it and concerned about it. And um, so that, I'm really looking forward to discussing that with you and learning about your kind of um, you know, policy perspectives and questions from the audience uh, about how yeah, open source AI has entered the, the policy room and policy discussion in the recent years. And the last thing I should say is uh, with both my hats, I uh, contributed to writing the model openness framework, uh, which is a product of the Gen AI Commons. I see Annie and Arnaud here who are the respective chairs and vice chairs. It's a, it's a community led by the Linux Foundation, AI Data Foundation. Um, so yeah, looking forward to being here, thanks. So thanks, thanks for this panel for, for, for coming together. Um, before we get uh, to the kind of more interesting or maybe more interesting to this audience, uh, up the stack policy discussions, it might be helpful to break down what makes up an AI system and how it's different uh, than, than source code. Um, Steph, you've been doing this for two years and thinking about this. Maybe you want to take a stab or anyone else can, can chime in as well. I'll, I'll try very quickly, not being an expert, but having been surrounded by many uh, with different expertise, with different, different interests for, for a couple of years now. I can summarize it like that. Uh, software is written by a human in, in what we call source code. And then through a transformation process called compilation, it becomes binary code and that gets executed by the machines. Very, very simple, very high level generic things, generic description, and uh, source code and binary code are two representations of the same artifact. They're basically the same thing uh, visualized in different ways, one for the humans, one for the computers, for the machines. When I approached the, well, we approached the question of what is, what is AI and how do we enable the same sort of collaboration, how to maintain the right to fork, to, to create derivatives and, and build on top, like how do we um, spin that wheel of innovation in the, in the AI space, we found out that that simple combination of source code to binary code did not apply. That paradigm was leading, applying that paradigm to understanding the space led to bad conclusions. So we had to ditch what we knew and start fresh. And when we started fresh, we realized with the help of the Linux Foundation work at the model, as they were developing the model openness frameworks, we identified, we saw that the practitioners have access in order to create an AI system like the modern, fun, exciting ones that we've seen recently. Think of uh, OpenAI's ChatGPT or Copilot, etc. Those that generate new things based on, on, uh, on an input we realize that they are made of large amount of data, lots of interesting and complicated, sophisticated software that does, cleans up the data, transforms it into, uh, into tokens, uh, and, you know, splits it out into something that can be fed into more code that does the training. That training spits out new, um, a new artifact called uh, parameters or weights uh, you, you hear these terms very often, even in legislation. So that whole pipeline is a lot more sophisticated, a lot more complicated than, uh, than the simple source code compilation binary. And it also is covered by a tremendous amount of different laws that we didn't have practical, practical exposure to. Like when it comes to generate, to assembling large data sets, we're talking petabytes, not gigabytes, those 
um, complicated, th those that that data becomes covered by comms, covered by content uh, uh, copyright law, privacy laws, and all other um, other legislations that doesn't prevents the simple distribution of that data. And so new new things we have to learn. Um, but we're getting very close to having an idea of how that collaboration spin cycle um, can can exist and can be replicated into the AI space. Yeah. I just want to add one thing, which is uh, we're, we talk about how difficult it is to define open source AI, but we should not forget how difficult it is to define AI in the first place. <laughs> and um, you know the. There are lots of different definitions for AI, and the definitional goalposts keep on shifting. And I think there are at least two factors that are shifting them. The first is actual breakthroughs, and the other is, I think, you know, marketing campaigns by companies, but also universities uh, trying to claim to be pushing the frontier. Uh, so, and I think it was wise to use the OECD's definition uh, because I think that was made through, agreed upon through a multi stakeholder process. It's been adopted in legal instruments by governments. And there's actually a paper at ACM Fact uh, three years ago by AI researchers who surveyed um, attendees at this conference, which is a, a major uh, AI ethics uh, conference organized by ACM, uh, and policymakers. And they gave them different definitions and tried to find, okay, what definitions can different te technical and non-technical stakeholders agree on? And the OECD definition is the one that got the most agreement. Um, so yeah, I just want to keep that in mind as we talk about how difficult it is to, to find open source AI. Yeah. And, and maybe for everybody, what's that definition? It's, it's uh, a, a machine that makes a prediction, the OECD definition? Okay, the OECD one, do you, yeah. want, do you want to quote it? I mean, I... And also, I can ask then, how does it, you know, because obviously the AI Act also has a definition, so yeah. is that based on the OECD one or is, does it, is it different? And, you know, which one's better? I guess you chose the OECD. Well, you, you know the answer to that. So the, the, the OECD, the, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, has maintains this definition of open source, of AI, artificial intelligence system. Artificial intelligence system is a uh, computer-based system that is, I, I'll synthesize it because it's a little longer, but what what is um, relevant to say is that it's, it's a computer-based system that based on an input can generate an output with a, a various degree of independence. It's a generic, generic um, description. And this one has been adopted by, it's been changed in November 2023 and adopted by the latest drafts and, and the final text of the AI Act as it was um, um, adopted, I mean, as it was developed. Thanks. All right. So now, now let's turn a little bit to the the policy side. Um, you know, as as um, AI kind of captured the imagination two years ago with ChatGPT and other um, and other generative models. Um, you know, you're responded by you know creating you know heavy regulations in response to kind of perceived dangers of having you know generated text, pictures, video, code, descriptions of. Um, chemical or biological compounds. Um, but there are relatively broad exceptions uh, for open source AI, which is, you know, relatively undefined in the in the act. Uh, Sachiko, it, OFE was really uh, heavily involved in, in that process. Any reflections on that work and, and what led to that, this exception? I'm wondering if I should engage in some self uh, criticism here or if I should try to, I think, you know, just going back to what I said initially, I think that, you know, um, the exceptions uh, that the exception that we have uh, currently, um, it's still, you know, it's not a clear definition of, of open source AI. It also has this notion of um, excluding open source that has a sort of when it's monetized and which is, I think, problematic. And I think to some extent, you know, I feel that both the CRA and the AI Act should kind of, my message, my general message is that this should be a sort of, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a part of a wake up call. We need to engage more proactively uh, and more um, 
uh, in a more sustained way, I think, in, in Brussels. I think that the open source, just as open source collaboration is, um, has tremendous power when it comes to developing technology, I think actually the open source community is pretty good at, at mobilizing, um, it, you know, to, to, uh, to affect the policy process as well. I find that to be also quite uh, interesting, given that we don't have um, a lot of people on the ground in Brussels. I think, you know, we managed to, to get heard. But I think moving forward, we will need to engage and stay engaged because you um, it's it, the policy process. It's a process, right? So you wake up one day, you have a draft that you think, oh, good, we can live with this draft. No, then there are other stakeholders that will come and talk to um, to policymakers, and they'll change, a, you know, they'll move a comma or something, or or add, a, 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 um, a, you know, a phrase, you know, and it can undo a lot of, you know, it to the policymakers that represents a good compromise, perhaps, but it can undermine, you know, a position that we've had. So you have to stay engaged, uh, really, in the process, and it starts much sooner than when we have typically been engaged. And so I think that OFE, I, I think that we are an organization, I've been involved with OFE since 2007. Uh, we've never been a big organization. Um, I think we punch above our weight. I think that, uh, that you know, um, the open source community, get they get more out of their policy engagement than sort of, in a way, they should, maybe, but there are other groups uh, and stakeholders that are less well organized, I would say. Um, but we, we can do more, uh, is my general message. And the, we could have done more specifically in this process as well. Um, yes. I'll, I'll just, we can maybe go into details later, but sure. I'll, I'll no, I just wanted to add that the, the this process we also got lucky at the European Parliament last in the past legislation because we had a lot of members of the, at least a couple of uh, groups that were elected in in, in Hungary in Germany. Uh, we had good representative people uh, who knew about open source. They came from the grassroots, if you want. I, I don't think we have the same luxury at this. Um, at this new parliament and uh, but we do punch above our weight because we have a distributed community that has carried those learned those um, the values in um, in um, you know on on the on the <laughs> working in the open source community and now bring it in brussels like that's one of the things that one of the strengths that we have but we do have to have more of ofe we have hired at the osi two people one one open position but one uh, person, because we need to be more engaged, constantly talking and educating the policymakers. Thanks. And you know, once the text is adopted, that's it's not going to be over. No. I mean, it's not over because then you know it's going to be in how you know the standards that are going to be developed. Because this is about sort of, it's a similar. I don't know if I should go too much into the policy process, but yes, yeah. okay. So this is a. Um, Last year, actually, I was at the the the, the in Bilbao at, at uh, the LF summit, and I talked about the CRA. And again, we are focusing on how it affects the open source community. But of course, we have to see the bigger picture. What is the policymaker? What are the policymakers trying to do? Well, they're extending something called like the new legislative framework, uh, which is has been a sort of instrumental part of uh, establishing. The, the European internal market. So the idea is, you know, that you extend um, this regime to software the first time. CRA and AI Act are very similar in that sense. So it's about sort of um, bringing the CE marking to, to software and to, to AI systems. And this is, you know, we are focused on how it affects the open source innovation, but this is about sort of being able to introduce products or services systems to the market while sort of, uh, and, and through a CE marking 
ensuring that you know consumers are protected. So before we had toy safety directive, we have radio equipment directive, all, all these like machine you know directive. It's about you know creating uh, this uh, s consumer safety in in verticals, and now they are trying you know to sort of have horizontal rules uh, for this, and I think the they are wanting to achieve a certain level of consumer protection uh, without needlessly hampering innovation. But their target is not, I mean, their main interest is not on open source or making it difficult for, you know, or anything like this. They just, you know, that's a kind of afterthought yeah. to some extent. So it's important to keep this, this perspective, I think. Um, and that there are going to be a lot of other stakeholders who think that this is a good, this is a good thing. You know, and I, if we're talking about this also about innovation, and I think which is a kind of a danger with this, um, with our focus on open source innovation, which I think open source is, even though it's not top of mind for everybody, and I, I, I digress a bit now, but I, I work at this research institute. I listen to, we have internal meetings about AI Act, you know, almost every week. A lot of researchers interested in, in AI, all, everybody's, that's what everybody's talking about. And I can tell you that I can sit through a one hour, two hour meeting about AI and it, like open source never comes up. You know, it's not, what comes up is the, the regulatory sandboxes because this is what most people are thinking well, okay, we have this going to have some fairly strict consumer protection regulation in place. We don't want to hamper innovation. We're going to have these regulatory sandboxes where we can have public private collaboration, you know, to innovate. And this, I don't think people are thinking this is necessarily going to happen in open source. No, this is a, going to be a possibility to work with, 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 uh, with, with companies, uh, you know, yeah, exactly. So. Yeah, thanks. Just to build on what you said, um, you know, the AI Act kicked into effect on the 1st of August last month, and um, these exceptions for open source AI, or these conditional exceptions, uh, raise the, the stakes. And we have to remember the, the aims of the AI Act, right? What the, or if you could simplify it, you could say, want to, you know, um, facilitate innovation and research, but also we want to, you know, ban and or agree on norms of certain applications that should not be allowed in in the EU and and beyond. And um, who here has read the specific exceptions for open source models? Okay, so three hands. So as you'll know, uh, there are different types of exceptions. So kind of pre-trained models. For argument's sake, let's just call them smaller models. That's uh, don't quote me on that, but um, generally fly under the radar if, uh, if they're released under free and open source licenses. But we don't really know yet, like you know, what components need to be shared and which licenses are appropriate. And Steph's work to define that, and our work to kind of provide guidance of what licenses are appropriate for which components tries to help that. But then for the second category, which uh, the commission calls GPAIM, or I don't know if I'm pronouncing that acronym right, but it's general purpose AI models, which, you know, we might otherwise call foundation models or so, you know, they, um, uh, they qualify for some exceptions, not as many as exceptions as, as the, the small models per se. Um, and those exceptions include uh, reporting obligations. And so this is why we have to be very careful about how we define what components have to be shared and which licenses are appropriate so that um, we can facilitate the sharing and collaboration and innovation of these models, but also make sure that you know, the risks that the AI, AI Act tries to avoid and mitigate, um, those, those aims are also um, defended and, and safeguarded. Uh, yeah. I might just add, there's also the, you know, the, the innovation is great. You have this kind of like sandbox and, and you know, boxing of, of AI, and we need to be careful about that. But then there's also, you know, if you pick that up and try to, you know, make it available to people, that deployment phase where the regulation kicks in, you need to be able to meet those reporting requirements, um, et cetera. So um, maybe now, you know, we've talked a little bit about kind of that, that regulatory framework. 
and why the definition is important. Let's talk a little bit about the definitions and then kind of come back um, you know, to that framework. So, Steph, you've been working on the open source AI definition, and Kaylin, you've been working on the model openness framework. Um, what are the what are they? <laughs> What's the difference between them, um, and and how if they are are they complementary of one another? Well, um, yes, they're complementary. But so the open source AI definition now in draft zero zero nine establishes that the same principles that we have for software we want to be transported into the AI space. So you need to be able, if you like a program, if you like an AI system, you need to be able to share it with others who like it. And share it means you need to be able to study without uh, how it works. Uh, you need to be able to modify it to suit your needs, give it to others, so share it. And of course, you need to be able to run it, to execute, to get the output based on the input that you want to give it. And the, um, the, the, for the machine learning uh, space, space uh, which is the, the most exciting one that, and the one that challenges the, the binary uh, software, um, the, yes, the, the source code to binary. For the machine learning, we, we have spent quite some time investigating what is the preferred form of making modifications to an AI system is. It's easy to understand how to run it. It's easy to understand how to give it to others. But what components, what pieces of a machine learning system you need to have access to in order to study exactly how it's been built and how to modify it, that was the challenging, the challenging part. And we're getting to a consensus where the components that are necessary are very detailed descriptions of what went into building the data set, including the source code for, that, is been, that has been used to create the data set. And um, you need to have access to the training code, understanding exactly how training has been um, performed. And of course, you need to, be, uh, ac to have access to the, 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 the result of that training, so the weights and parameters. And how exactly to do that, it, you can use one of the frameworks that is readily available, which is the, the MOF. And that's where I see the complementary part. Look at the model openness framework. And, uh, and, and see which of those components are necessary to run, study, use, and share. Yeah, I, I commend the, the bravery of the task that you took on of defining it, because that's not, I think where we differ is that our task was, or our mission is not to define open source AI. What we wanted to do was uh, tackle some problems, which include, uh, you know, confusion. What is open source AI, what is not? Uh, this is made worse by you know, open washing campaigns that we've seen in the last year. Uh, a, a big problem is misuse of licenses. Um, this includes um, introduction of restrictive licenses, but also um, use of software licenses for, for weights. But we, we classify weights as data components and models. So what we wanted to do, and I say we, it's, you know, myself and my five co-authors and the wider Gen AI community, was just take machine learning models, not all of you know, AI. So we limit our, our scope and say, okay, how can you break this down into components? And uh, we kind of came up with 16 or 15 as <laughs> we have this ongoing debate, so let's say 16. And we categorize them into code, data, and content components. So code includes the, you know, the code you use to pre-process the training data. It, um, might include uh, evaluation code that you use for evaluating the model. Uh, data includes components like the pre-training data set or the alignment data set. It uh, inc also includes the model weights. And then the content includes things like the technical report or the, the, the preprint on archive or published paper if you have one, model card and so on. And uh, for each uh, component category, we recommend appropriate licenses. Um, so we try to try tackle that problem of uh, misuse of licenses. And then what we do is we create this three-tiered ranked classification system um, with you know different musts and shoulds of which components must and should be released to classify uh, for that class. So the minimum is uh, class three, open model. So that would be the, the weights, the architecture, um, the model card, and so on. And then the second is um, the open tooling that includes a lot of the code that I mentioned. And then the, the ultimate one is open science, which would include 
the, the training data sets and, and so on. Um, a problem or weakness of the, the MOF is it's, it's a white paper, it's about 30 pages long, so Arnaud, who's sitting here in the second row, has kindly taken on the job of writing a spec. It's 14 pages long, and for each component it just says, this is a must and this is a should, so you can go there, it's like, you know, three lines per component, I'm like, okay, I know exactly what I need to do because I feel like that wasn't clear in the, in the MOF. Um, and our, 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 our goal is right, really to give guidance and clarity to model producers and users. So thanks for you know, helping make that clear. And the other thing we're trying to do is you know, we're building a model openness tool which users and producers can use to evaluate um, two uh, things about models. I should have mentioned this earlier. Two key terms are openness and completeness, which we take from open science. Uh, openness is a binary classification. Is a component openly distributed or not? under the right or appropriate license, and completeness is the spectrum. You know, how many of the right components or, or required components are being released to classify for class one, class two, class three. So yeah, so just to summarize, our goal is to provide guidance for model users, producers, to address some of the bad practices, uh, but not to define open source AI. We had a question in the back. Can I, uh, yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. Can I just come in quickly just to say that I'm not, don't, want to comment on the details of the definition or the framework, but more about sort of that from a policy perspective, it is important that as a community, we come together and we are able to point to something and that we can show that we have some unity that helps tremendously with sort of bringing a clear message. Um, on the other hand, I think that what we see in all these um, policy texts, there isn't a kind of, they're not going to, the commission is not going to refer directly to an OSI definition or even an OECD definition. They're going to come up with their own, unfortunately, I think, um, and they're not going to refer to the framework, you know, so we are going to have to, because that's why you see you in the AI Act, the CRA, the Interoperable Europe Act, the European Interoperability Framework, the definition of open source, it's all over the place, right? Well, I mean, it's not the same. They're not going to just refer to here, you have the OSI definition. That means that we will need to communicate and engage in every process, every on every file. Um, but it helps to say the community, you know, is, is unified. This is what we mean when we say open source AI. So, yeah. Question in the back and then... Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I just have two questions. So first is to OSI. Uh, can you name, uh, call out the other organizations or uh, communities that were involved in the creation of this definition or was it OSI alone? And second is, and this could be, you know, the last question of the session as well, that I like the, when you said that, you know, we should do more and we, we, we need to do more. But if you can summarize, you know, the panel can summarize uh, five pointers or three action points, you know, in the next year or so. I think you're up first. Um, so off the top of my head, the groups that we have engaged with are, um, research groups, research, research institutions uh, like uh, Princeton, Stanford, um, in Oxford, researchers in, in different parts of the world. Uh, we have engaged with the open communities, so I'm saying Linux Foundation, Eclipse Foundation, Creative Commons. Um, um, we have engaged with, um, we've asked questions and uh, pulled them in also the subjects of, of AI, so users, um, the, the EFF, um, the ACLU, um, uh, we have engaged with uh, researchers in ethics, uh, experts in ethics and other, other fields, so, um, of course software developers, um, AI practitioners in corporations, small and big. Like we really have a few hundred people um, involved of, with different extractions, and we classify them in um, six stakeholder uh, stakeholder groups, and we try to be geographically distributed at the same time. So we made really a tremendous effort that we uh, to 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 be as global as possible because we do know that we want to have uh, a story that is supported by 
a wide community. We can't go to the European Commission and say the OSI has this, you know, vested, in, vested, um, invested authority. Like we gain the author the same authority that we have. The authority that we have in the open source space is not because we have magically received it. It's because so many people with so many interests so from so many parts of the world, all of them point at us when they say, whatever the OSI says, we believe it. And we built a f what we think is a very fair, global, multi-stakeholder conversation to, to come to this, to this point. And for the second question, I... I I didn't have time to come up with five, <laughs> five well-defined action points. Um, but I think, you know, what we had a discussion also, you and I, after yesterday's panel about how, you know, I know you're from Gartner, so you um, also advise companies what they should be doing in open source. So I think it's really important to be able to, again, point to something, you know, like what should we be doing? And you know, one, two, three, four, five. Um, I think one important part, and you already talked about the fact that you have, you know, as I, for example, you have, you're in the process of hiring, you know, permanent policy um, people. Uh, I think it is this kind of institutionalizing, you know, hiring people who has as like their full-time job, uh, job description to be working on policy following these issues. That's an important part of making sure that this is a sustained effort. So I would say this is, the, for me, at least the first step that um, that um, open source stewards, all these associations, not only Open Forum Europe, uh, that there there is a kind of, you know, that we, that there are policy people uh, hired by these organizations and that they also um, collaborate yeah. amongst each other. So um, actually I saw somebody make this comment on our mailing list. Uh, I don't know, some of you might be on uh, Open, open Forum Europe's uh, open source, uh, what is it? Uh, ta what is it called? <laughs> Task force mailing list, whatever. There was a comment about this actually, it's like who is, who is talking about open source in Brussels? Who are they? Shouldn't we make sure that they have at least some kind of a, there's a network among these people that we know who the, you know, who these people are and that they can collaborate also. And from time to time, you know, so professionalizing it, making sure that there are people full time working on this and that they're working together to some extent to, to, to bring this message. <laughs> I'll just add one and then Justin will hand over to your questions. <laughs> well, I, I think we're almost at time, so I'll, oh, I'll actually okay. pass the mic on to the, to person in the audience, but after you. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, just very quick. Um, so I think another thing we have to do is build more bridges and break down more walls. Um, on Monday, my colleagues at Linux Foundation Research, we brought out our annual Europe Spotlight Report. Um, and for that, we did survey and uh, have hundreds of open source practitioners in Europe, but also two dozens of interviews. And I interviewed a AI researcher at the Alan Turing Institute in London, which is the UK's National AI Research Center. And she's a computer scientist and open source AI practitioner who I really admire. But her expertise is in, in, in the open data part of open source AI. And she was telling me that you know, this work to, you know, define what is open source AI and what cannot be open source AI has really shut doors for folks in her community. Um, and that's, you know, kind of led to the splintering and, and fragmentation. So I think we need to work to, you know, kind of heal those wounds or bring those communities back together because there's no AI without data. So we need the open data community contributing to. Excellent. Travel the world again. Oh, yes. <laughs> No, no, I'm, I'm good. La last question. Uh, thank you. So, um, Kaylin, you took a very specific stance when you were talking about the framework. So I'm curious from the authors, um, do, you, do you have legal scholars that you consulted with when you created the framework and took a position that model weights were a specific kind of content? And um, is that the official position of the LF AI and data group? Sorry. Should have stayed there to bring the mic back. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so I'll speak for on behalf of myself, and then I can, I think, uh, and, high, and high, you know, high level, high level speak for my five co-authors, but then I can't speak for the others, the Gen AI Commons. 
Um, I'm a data scientist and everyone else in the co-authors are computer scientists. We're not legal scholars and legal experts. So we don't have that uh, personal expertise. Uh, but we did speak to uh, folks in our immediate communities, uh, including, for example, Linux Foundation, who have experience. I can't say they're a lawyer of licenses, but who gave advice. Of, and with model weights, it's it's new new terrain. So um are kind of informed or educated decision was to classify them as data components so that's what i can say but i don't know annie and and uh, i'll do i'll i'll add something oh there, yeah. which is you know the, the you know I, I think what you said is is exactly right i mean the 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 question i think is dealing with you know what framework are we judging the protectability or you know copyrightability or data uh, you know, data um, act protection for, for weights, right? And I think the, the underlying answer that, you know, the very solid legal answer that I'll give is nobody knows. <laughs> like nobody and on knows. On that note, I, I, I want to add one, which is a policy question for all of us, is to, it's not silly in my mind to ask ourselves what it should be called. What should we consider that? What, what is the best... Uh, choice for society as a whole um, to uh, to consider those weights and parameters. Right? Do do we need another legal framework, a completely new one, or shall we just use one that exists? And which one? No, 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 no problem. Just very, yeah, just, just very quickly, I'd just tell you. Um, so Arno and I were the chairs of Generative AI Commons. So this is our. Um, probably the most important work we have done you know, today. So the reason we came out with MOV was because there's a lot of open washing and we want to give model producers a, a way to be totally transparent. So Kaylin and some research and some researchers from you know a couple of universities and from um, Linus Foundation came up with this white paper. So it's a white paper, it's kind of thought leadership paper. And, and we, now we're trying to formalize it. That's what Arnoy is trying to do, is to create a spec. So we are in the process of formalizing it. But again, it's not supposed to be a, some, it's a, like a legal kind of guidance or anything like that. It's more for people to show transparency. And I, you know, we definitely welcome Google or you know, anybody, uh, the legal teams to help us too. So we are still in the process of you know, perfecting it. It's not perfect right now. Hi, so I'm Arnold Ross from IBM, Vice Chair of Gen AI Commons. And I mean, to directly answer your question, we cannot claim this is LFAI data's position. This paper didn't go through a formal review by the whole organization asking for everybody's opinion, can we claim that? So that's the answer. All right, well, we're, we're well over time. Um, so I really appreciate everybody's you know, patience and attention. And yeah, I think this was a great you know, start to more conversations around this space. And you know, to, to the question of you know, what can we do, I think you know, talk to each other, get consensus, and, and, and then, and then you know, go together. So thanks, everyone. <laughs> <laughs>